In this video, I'm going to be talking about problem solving and critical thinking. This is our first section of this course, Math 1332. And uh, we're going to start by looking at um, two types of reasoning, inductive and deductive reasoning. But before we do that, I just want to say, you know, it's certainly important to be a good problem solver. That's something true not only in a math course, but also when you get out in the real world. Certainly, uh, my son, who's an engineer, he does a huge amount of problem solving. But there's a lot of places where problem solving is really important. We need to become better problem solvers. And critical thinking, you know, you hear all the time about how important that is. I really think these days our culture is so easy, or, or the people in our country are so easy to... Um, it's easy to change people's minds because people don't tend to think things through. And it's really important that you can think about something more deeply and more critically. You know, a lot of times we're being told things in our culture, in the news or whatever it is. And if you're just buying everything you're told, you're going to be misled quite frequently. So I, t I always tell my students, I want you to be thoughtful thinkers. I want you to have a a healthy skepticism. You don't want to buy everything that you're sold. And so I hope that throughout this course will help you to think a little bit more cri uh, critical uh, and, and also do some problem solving. All right, so let's go ahead and look at um, this first problem here. It says find the next two terms for each pattern. So I'd like you to go ahead and do A through G and let's see how many of these you can do. So my guess is that you'll get anywhere from three to five. If you get all of them, you've really done something. So see what you can do, and then I'll go through the answers. All right, so for A, you should have gotten 17 and 21. And the pattern is to just add four. One plus four is five, five plus four is nine, and so on. Uh, another common pattern would be to subtract some number each time. All right, on letter B, the next two numbers are 162 and negative 486. So in this case, what's the pattern? Well, we're multiplying by negative 3 each time. Now in C, I'm always surprised at how few students do or, or identify the pattern the way that I do. It doesn't really matter. I mean, you have to find the pattern whatever way you can get. And I think because of the first two problems, um, students tend to, uh, to get this following pattern that I'm going to show you. By the way, the, uh, in B, we multiplied by negative 3. Another pattern would be each time to divide by some number. All right, so on C, the next two numbers are 25 and 36. Now, most students will say, hey, I added 3, and then I added 5, and then I added 7, and then 9, and then 11. So that's perfectly uh, true. You're, you found a pattern there. But actually, there's another one as well. These numbers are special numbers. They're called perfect squares. 1 is 1 squared. 4 is 2 squared. So when we get up to here, this is 5 squared, or 5 times itself. And this is 6 squared. All right, so either of those is correct, though. Let's look at D. Now on D, I hope that you're thinking, Mr. Smith, I don't think there's just one answer here. And if that's what you said, you'd be right. Oops, oh goodness, I messed up here. Let me get past here. All right, actually, before I do that, let me just get rid of those extra marks. There we go. All right, so you could have 6 and 8. We're just adding 2 each time. But the other pattern would be 2, 4, 8, 16, and so on. So in other words, in order to identify the pattern, you've got to be given enough numbers. And in this case, we were not given enough numbers so that we really knew what the pattern would be. There's more than one answer. In fact, you may have even found some other pattern. All right, so I'm going to go to E next, because that's probably the next hardest problem. And the next two numbers are 13 and 21. This is a famous sequence called the Fibonacci sequence. 
and these numbers appear in nature, especially if you look at like um, the number of petals on flowers and there's some other things in nature that occur this way. But basically, these two numbers will give you the next number two, and then one and two will give you the next number three, and so on. So five and eight gives you the 13, and eight and 13 gives you the 21. And so that's that pattern. On letter E, if you didn't get it, I'm gonna show you something and you're gonna see it right away. The thing about E is if you're locked into the same kind of thinking you were doing previously, you won't get it because it's not that kind of pattern. You have to find something different and that's how patterns can be. There's so many different things we could look for, so many different kinds of patterns. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and put these lines right down the middle. And so can you see these are just numbers and their mirror image? So the next one would be 5 with its mirror image, and then 6 with its mirror image. And so if you got that one, you should give yourself a pat on the back. Most people do not get that one. Uh, all right, so let's look at G. And G is another totally different outside-of-the-box type of pattern. And I think for most students, you either see it or you don't. But it's certainly very simple. The next two letters are J and J. And so you can't look at any kind of order of the letters. It's just uh, recognizing some pattern. The pattern is these are the months of the year. January, February, March, April, May, June, July. All right, let's move on to the next slide. All right, so we're going to talk about inductive reasoning first. And uh, inductive reasoning, well, it says we use inductive reasoning when we observe a series of events and then make a general conclusion. So we go from some specific events to some kind of conclusion or what's called a hypothesis or conjecture. So for example, I could say my first three instructors at Brookhaven College were awesome. So my hypothesis would be all Brookhaven instructors are awesome. Now it says here, if there is just one case for which my hypothesis doesn't hold, then my conjecture is false. We call this a counterexample. All right, so here's it. So basically, I have three teachers from at Brookhaven. They're all awesome. I conclude all Brookhaven instructors are awesome. Well, then I have my next instructor, and he bores me to tears. That's a counterexample to my hypothesis. It does not support my hypothesis. I can now say it's no longer true. Now, if you talk to all your friends and they said all of their instructors were great, then this would be a, a strong, um, then you would have a strong argument based on all these different people's experiences. If um, maybe you have another, your next friend you talked to had all bad teachers. And so in that case, it, this hypothesis that all instructors are awesome would maybe be quite weak. Some are good, some are not so good. And so when we talk about inductive arguments, we measure them in terms of their strength. So here's an example on A. I ran into three bad drivers on the freeway on my way to school. My hypothesis is Dallas drivers are terrible on the freeway. Now, I literally, when I was going to school, would drive the freeway every morning, and it was hard to get through a morning without running into somebody that, <laughs> that did something that kind of made you a little frustrated. So I would say uh, most people probably have had the same type of experiences, and so they would probably say, this is a relatively strong argument, or at least moderate. Now, in some cases, it might be debatable. I think this one's relatively strong. Um, again, when we talk about the teachers all being great at Brookhaven, you know, if you 
down talking to your friends, it's like 50-50, then you don't have a strong argument at all. It would be quite weak. So when we, we can't really prove an inductive argument. We can just talk in terms of how strong our, our hypothesis is. All right, if you haven't already done B, do B, and then you can uh, check the answer here. All right, so your next figure should look like that. And in fact, there's two patterns going on here. One, you're doing circle, square, circle, square, and so on. And two, the dots are rotating counterclockwise. So notice the, the dot here, if you rotate it up 90 degrees, basically, now you're here. And this one here goes to there, and now you're there. And so the dots are ro rotating 90 degrees counterclockwise. All right, let's move on to the next slide. So it says with deductive reasoning, um, the process of proving a specific conclusion, it's the process of proving a specific conclusion from one or more general statements. So a conclusion that is proved to be true by deductive reasoning is called a theorem. So the difference between inductive reasoning is the following. With an inductive argument, we look at three cases or a few cases, and then we make some hypothesis, some general statement. With deductive reasoning, we actually, in this section, we're usually just going to have one general statement, but it could be more than one, usually one or more, or a couple. Um, and then, based on that general statement, we can come up with something uh, we can conclude something specific. All right, our conclusion is specific. So they're opposite as far as uh, the reasoning is concerned. Let, let's look in an, at an example. On example one, it says Robert gets frustrated every time he takes an algebra test. I'm, I'm sure some of you understand that feeling. Um, Robert took an algebra test today. So the conclusion would be, Robert must be frustrated. Maybe somebody needs to take this guy out, get him an ice cream or something. Anyway, so that's what we call deductive reasoning. This is a general statement. In general, Robert gets frustrated when he takes an algebra test. And so now we have a specific statement. Robert took an algebra test. And so our conclusion based on deduction, is that Robert must be frustrated today. So we go from a general statement to a specific statement in this type of argument. All right, let's look at example two. So this is actually going to be inductive uh, reasoning here. Let's go ahead and uh, uh, let's see. Hold on just a second. Uh, so actually, I'm sorry, this is not inductive, it is deductive. Let's go ahead and, and work through the problem and then we'll, we're actually going to prove this. So it says in A, select a number, multiply by 4, add 6, divide by 2, subtract 3 from the quotient. For B, it says do this four time, or for four different numbers and then make a hypothesis. All right, so Let's go ahead and uh, I would encourage you to do that. Although actually maybe I'll do one real quick for you here. So these are the numbers I chose. So I started with one and I multiplied by four. I added six to four and I got 10. I divided 10 by two and I got five. I subtracted three and I got two. And so Again, uh, if you haven't already done this, you might want to do this for your, your, your total of four numbers. I'm going to go ahead and give you the answers to the rest of these. And, uh, and so if you look at where we started, that's what I circled up top, and you look at where we ended, we have a hypothesis. It looks like my number doubles. Right? We went from 1 to 2, 3 to 6, 4 to 8, and so on. Now keep in mind, this is not a proof. All right, so what we're really doing is 
we're trying to make a general statement and then we want to prove it to be true. All right, let's go to the next slide. It says use the variable n to represent the original number and use deductive reasoning to prove your argument or your conjecture. All right, so here we're going to let n equal the number. What, what we're basically saying, let me go back to the previous uh, screen. What we're basically saying is if you start with any number, you multiply by 4, you add 6, you divide by 2, and then you subtract 3, your number doubles. So that's a general statement that we're trying to prove. All right, that's why it's deductive. All right, so we let n equal the number. And the first thing we're going to do is multiply by 4, and we get 4n. And then we're going to add 6, we get 4n plus 6. Remember, those are not like terms. You can't add a variable term with a number term. So notice we are doing a little algebra today, but we're going to keep it pretty simple here. And then we're going to divide by 2. So we'll take 4n plus 6 divided by 2. Now, you may or may not recall, but we can actually break this fraction into 2. This is 4n over 2 plus 6 over 2, which is 2n plus 3. And so finally, we're going to subtract 3. We got 2n plus 3 minus 3, and we get 2n. So notice we started with n, and doing these four operations, we ended with, up with twice the number we originally had. So this is a proof of our general statement. All right, and that's the end of this video.